everyone. Now we go into a little bit of the meat of the um, topic, which is really what happens after the loading dose, right? I think uh, anyone not doing loading dose for AMD. So let's put that aside, okay? If you don't do a loading dose, you are going to have two, to, probably about two lines difference compared to if you have a loading dose. Why do you think that's so? What's so important about the loading dose? If you recall in Marina Anchor, so that was our first pivotal trial, right? anti vegf Mizumab. When was the period of maximum visual increase? The first three months. Okay. And that was how actually, in the phase two, we observed that the first three doses seemed to have the greatest impact. In fact, the first two injections. Do you recall many patients telling you, first injection, wow effect. Second injection, wow effect. <laughs> Third injection, right? Okay. The greatest increase, the exponential increase is after the first injection, second injection. After that, it tapers off. And that's how the concept of um, loading dose came about. There was no secret to it, right? We tested it, and then we said, when was the time the peak or the plateau was achieved? Usually by three months, say in about 60, 70% of the time. After that, it was a flat line. Is this so in other retinal diseases? If you look at, let's say, diabetic macular edema, do you see the same pattern? Anyone? You don't see it after first three injections only. There's, yes, there is an increase in the first two, three injections, but it doesn't stop there. Certainly in CRBO, macular edema and CRBO, it goes on for much longer, probably six months and beyond. And in DME, at least four usually five, six months. So the concept of loading dose is not so applicable for non-EMD. Okay. So let's just put that aside. Loading dose to me, no discussion. All right. But what is optimal after that? Well, what's optimal is not perfect. We talked about it already. We are not curing disease, we are controlling disease. Okay. But what's our ideal treatment? Okay, let's say you have AMD, new vascular AMD, and you are looking for the perfect or well, the most ideal treatment currently. What do you want? Best visual gain, best maintenance of visual gain, fewer injections, the less treatment, the better, fewer visits, fewer visits, cost. Yes? So that's your ideal. I don't think we have a really perfect one, but let's look at what are the strategies that we can use to try and achieve as close as possible to this ideal. So we call that optimized regimen. So by now, you should all know that anti-VEGF is the gold tree. Any dispute there for AMD? For neovascular AMD, I think no dispute. If you talk about polypoidal, we can debate, right? Whether you need to add DDT or focal reasons. But I'm talking about colloidal neovascularization. Why? Because Marina, Anchor, and Liu, the two drugs approved for AMD, showed the same effect. If you give monthly treatment, best results. Even if it is a best result. If you give in the first set three loading doses and then two monthly injections, QP, for the first two years, first year at least, you get equivalent result to monthly treatment. Okay. So frequent, regular, fixed treatment, the best. So if your Prime Minister came to you and he asked you, what is the current best treatment for my AMD, you would tell him in the first year, fixed treatment. Best result but not ideal. And some people are doing it. Many countries, they give three first injections, Q8 and the set. We call that on label. That means approved for use. But if you look carefully at Q8 and the set, not all of them do well. Because some of them start to have fluid accumulation. Well, I told you fluid, fluid accumulation can start before vision drops. So their vision can remain stable over eight weeks. But by
by six weeks, five weeks, fluid starts to come back. There's a little bit of a seesaw pattern. You saw that in the Q8 arm of the fluid cell. Is that ideal? No. Because you're probably <coughs> under-treating them. You're keeping the vision alive, but structurally in the long term, I think the photoreceptors will suffer. The other thing, of course, is do we need monthly treatment for everybody? The answer is no. In this study called Harbour, 93% in the PRN group, that means after three loading doses, they come back every month for follow-up, and based on disease activity, and we'll talk about that afterwards, again, based on disease activity, they treat or they don't treat. 93% did not need monthly treatment. Only 7% monthly, 49% needed treatment every one to two months, quite frequent. 44% could go beyond two months. But that told us that different people behave differently and you don't need to treat everybody with monthly treatment. It's a bit of an overkill. For example, if you look at monthly treatment, you end up with almost 12 injections a year, right? But in the PRN group, 7.7, 7, so about 8 injections in the first year, and just 5 to 6 injections in the second year were required to maintain the same or achieve the same visual ability. So therefore, we start to cut our frequency of treatment. The evolution is from monthly to PRN, by monthly fix, PRN, and now something called treat and extend. So if you want fixed dosing, you can, right? Monthly ranibizumab or bevacizumab. First three loading doses monthly of Glibacet followed by Q8 of Glibacet for the first year. Possible. No one will quibble with you with that. But a little bit of an overkill. So you can individualize with non-fixed regimen. First three loading doses, followed by PRN, that means pro-renata, right, as needed. Or treat and extend. So let's examine each view. PRN, pro-renata, requires the most important criteria is frequent visits. If you don't see the patient and monitor the patient monthly, or maximum six weekly, you are not doing PRN, prorenata. You are doing progressive retinal neglect. <laughs> Why? You don't see them. You think all is good. But actually, you are causing the vision to get worse and worse. So a lot of people, if you ask in the audience, I go to international meetings, right? I ask them, how many people do PRN? OK, maybe 60%, 70%. How many of you who are doing PRN see the patient monthly? Less than half. Okay. So that is the issue. Not PRN treatment. PRN treatment is very good. But we are not monitoring them in a timely way. Not <coughs> enough. We've gone through already why signs of clinical activity are swimming. The two pillars are visual acuity, functional, OCT, and FA, structure. So I'm not going to go through all that again. But the relevance is, whatever criteria you use has an impact on the results. Yes. In the early days called Pronto Sailor, we used two criteria. Visual acuity, and at that time, time domain. So we used quantitative OCT. 100 micron increase from the previous visit. 100 micron is a lot. Think about it, right? What's the normal phobia thickness? About 250, 280, depending on what system you use. What's the difference between the foveal thick, subfoveal thickness in a Heidelberg compared to a serous, a Zeiss serous? Which one thicker? Why? This trivia piece. Yeah. Okay. Anyone knows? Where does the caliper sit in Hyderabad? Internal limiting membrane to 
Brooks to Brooks. In most other systems, it's internal membrane to RPE. The difference is the RPE thickness. Okay? RPE to Brooks. Uh, one is to the Brooks, one, or actually the base of the RPE, not the Brooks. Because sometimes when the Brooks is uh, detached from the RPE, it still measures the retinal thickness, not the whole PD. So my mistake is not to the Brooks, it's to the base of the RPE. As opposed to most other systems, internal limiting membrane to the surface of the RPE. Okay, so that's just how you at least read differences in thickness between the machines. So very important when you are reviewing, let's say the patient has come with a different OCT machine reading, you must take that into consideration. Okay. But anyhow, Proto Sailor, these were the first trials that used PRN. They used visual acuity for five letters. And it's worse by five letters and an increase of at least 100 or more than 100 microns on time of view. When you do that, you find that the visual acuity after loading dose starts to slip. Okay? <coughs> Meaning that your treatment is not enough. You are not achieving the best result with the monthly treatment. Okay? What we want is to be able to keep it up, right? Something like the monthly treatment. So what was the difference? It was the way that the disease was deemed active. In harbour, it used number one, spectral domain. Number two, qualitative science. Any fluid treat on spectral domain. So much more sensitive than time domain. And can you see the difference? Plus eight letters maintained, eight letters at one year. So this is PRN. I'm not saying that PRN is no good. Actually, PRN done in the right way, monitoring every month, using the right criteria, very strict, no doubt. But you get a good result. So PRN is good in the right conditions. And therefore, you find that as we move along, as we understand the disease more in the treatment, the early trials are not sufficient. Our criteria were too lax. So if you want to do PRN, what are the lessons? Must monitor monthly or almost monthly must use strict criteria. CAT, C-A-T-T, use the term no tolerance. They see fluid, they treat. Of course, now some people say, I see some subretinal fluid. Let's say after I treat for one year, I still have a little bit of subretinal fluid, maybe I will treat. But to make it simple for you, if you see subretinal fluid, you still treat. Okay? No tolerance of fluid. And therefore, qualitative science are more important than quantitative. Quantitative just gives you a, sort of a measurement of the degree of response. It's good because it's reproducible, but it's not enough. I mentioned already some retinal hyperreflective material, right? As another qualitative sign. This one I've showed, so I will talk about that. If you compare monthly fix or view, which is QA, right? so fix versus PRN and TNE, there is still a little bit of discrepancy. So even when the PRN is done well, you are not achieving exactly the same results. And so people start looking at whether we should be proactive rather than reactive. We call PRN treatment a reactive treatment because you are waiting for something to happen. Right? So you're waiting for vision to drop, you're waiting for fluid to appear, you're waiting for shroom to appear. But that's not always the best way to deal with disease. If we know that the disease becomes active after a fixed period, let's say every seven weeks, do we wait until after the disease becomes active before we treat? Not necessarily. So some people are talking about proactive treatment. Before the disease comes, I treat. But because I treated before the disease, I can now extend the interval. That is the principle of proactive treatment extent disease. Why is this important? Because across the world, and I'm 
sure in your country and in my country, the overall results are not that great. So real world, this is in developed countries, uh, UK and France, UK not bad, but in France, free healthcare, mind you. So patient doesn't have to pay for any of the medicine. Yet, you see, not good. Most of it, ERM. So why? Under treatment is the reason. I mentioned, right? You don't usually lose vision with over treatment. You tend to lose vision with under treatment. And why under treatment with PRN? We already mentioned non monthly visits, not in our monitoring. Your criteria for treatment too relaxed. Yeah? Not aggressive enough. And sometimes patients don't want to come in. Patients don't come in because they feel that they are well, that vision is good. You have to explain to them that vision alone is not the only criteria for treatment and they may not feel the disease coming back. In fact, one of the first questions I ask them, let's say I know that the fluid has come back and their vision is jumped down. The first question I ask them is, do you feel any change? Do you feel you don't tell them good or bad because they, they may not. You cannot sort of bias them, right? And if they say no, I don't feel any change. Despite losing one line, two lines of letters, despite having more fluid, I say there you have it. If you can't feel, you can't trust your own sub symptoms sometimes in assessing whether you need treatment or not. I think that's quite an important principle. We do this all the time in glaucoma, right? Pressure 25, if you know. Then they are not convinced, right, that you have to add or change medication. You have to convince them that sometimes symptoms don't always correlate with the actual reality. So first thing you do next time, you just ask the patient, so how do you feel from your last visit? Do you feel any change? Then you say, no, I'm fine, my vision is very good. Then you can tell them, unfortunately, our readings today, our results are not there. First, your vision has dropped by two lines. Secondly, you have new fluid. That would make them think a little bit. Otherwise, they become a bit complacent. Other patients are very accurate. The other of reverse is vision's the same, but the patient says, I feel something is going on bad. And then you see fluid. Right? You have some patients like that. So, talking to the patient is absolutely critical. I don't know whether in your country there's a move towards having nurses inject patients. No? Any of your countries? In the UK, yes, a lot of nurses are doing it, nurse practitioners. In Singapore, slowly, some nurses are doing it. I'm not saying that nurses cannot give injections, no problem. It is a decision making and talking to patients about that. When you disjoint the Someone just to give injection, the other one is to do the examination and do the, the counselling. Sometimes it is disjointed. What I'm saying is that you have to talk to the patient and then review an issue. Okay? So the two extremes, patients may not feel it, but actually they have active disease. Or you may not see any change in vision, but they are symptomatic. Pay attention to those two. So again, emphasize that there is a lag phase between the time the vision drops and the time that the Fluid comes back. This is luminous. I told you about this. Real world data is not a clinical trial, just observation. Only 17% receive more than five injections per year. And that's why the visual acuity is so poor. Under treatment is the primary cause of failure of any failure for the injury. Now, the few studies were also important for us because it introduced the concept of CAT PRN. I don't know how many of you remember the second year, this was novel at the time. Second year, if they didn't need treatment, they didn't receive treatment, but every three months, whether they need it or not, they were given an injection. Proactive. First year was very strong proactive, right? Three loading dose, QA. Every two months, whether you need it or not, you get Second year, more lax, but cat PR every 12 weeks. And the 
result was the first year results were maintained and the second year results. What did you tell me? You told me that when you proactively treat, you don't need to be so aggressive in the second year, but when you proactively treat, you would have a better chance of maintaining your first year results. So this was very interesting, that proactive component. Now when you compare now PRN with treat and extend, across the board, treat and extend in blue did better than PRN. This is in uh, meta-analysis, okay? So this is many patients. Can you see how many? This is meta-analysis. So it's quite a nice snapshot. PRN gained 3.5 letters, treat and extend 8.8 letters. Of course, you have more visits. Interestingly, the Renibizumab uh, arm, 8.6, because you have to see them actually almost monthly. This was under, right? You should be seeing that 12 visits. <coughs> but with treat and extend, you reduce the number of visits because once they are stable, you can extend the visits. But more injections. You cannot have the best of both worlds, right? So if you want to have a reasonably close result to fix monthly, then treat and extend is better than PRN. Agree? Treat and extend. <coughs> Why is that so? Very simplistically, if you look at number of injections, what's the sweet spot is seven to eight injections. Seven to eight injections. How many of you counsel patients when they first come in, new in case of AMD, not started any therapy? How many of them tell how many of you tell patients you will likely to need seven to eight injections in the first year? Good? Good? Keep it up. The rest of you start saying that. Why? You have to set the right expectation for patients. If they go away thinking that after three injections they are fine, and the treatment is over and it's done, you have failed. It's actually worse. Because when they subsequently get a recurrence, they blame you. They don't realize that this disease is going to go on and on and on. But in the first year, statistically, after the first three loading doses, they will need at least five to six more injections. It's, 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 and I just don't understand why many doctors are still afraid to tell the patients the, the truth. They say three injections, and we'll see. What do you mean we'll see? We'll see how many more injections you will need, but you will need on average seven to eight injections. That's, that is a given. And that's why patients end up with five injections or less. Because they say, my doctor told me, three injections and you are done. So can we try that when you go back and you see new cases? The first three injections are monthly, after which you will need a further on average four to five more injections. Right? To maintain the injection. I think that's reasonable. So the patient knows this is not the end after the week. So what is treat? Extent. Anybody uses tree and extent? It's a new concept. It's been around, but not so many people in Asia use it. Okay. So let me explain. Loading dose every four weeks, so regardless of agent. Remember, I said three initial injections. Actually, when you talk about tree and extent, you give as many as required until no disease activity. It could be three, it could be five, it could be six, depending on patient. So let's say after three injections, still will do it. You give another one at month eight. Month five, dry. Then you can start to extend. How do you extend? You extend by two weeks. Few queer things about tree and extend. You always treat when dry. That means you don't wait for fluid to come before you treat. Every time you see the doctor, you treat. There are some advantages and disadvantages to that. But when there is no disease activity, you are allowed to extend. When you see disease activity, you cannot extend. In fact, you should pull back. Because the disease was not inactive by the time you saw him at the last visit. You understand what I'm saying? So let's say, 
we started with three initial injections dry. No activity, vision improved. I can extend now. Next visit, six weeks, but I treat. At six weeks, no fluid, what do you do? Treat and extend. Okay? Treat and extend to eight weeks. At eight weeks, fine, dry, no activity. Treat and extend again. Ten weeks. But at ten weeks, fluid. What do you do? Treat and pull back to eight weeks. Now, when can you drop by more than two weeks? When are the circumstances where I would drop it by more than two weeks, even four weeks? When it's a serious event. So normally, bleed, hemorrhage, or visual acuity, great drop, maybe more than five letters, more than ten letters, a significant drop. Later, I'll show you a study called RIO, an Australian study, that use some fixed criteria depending on which one was present, they might drop by four weeks. Sometimes we even drop back to a loading dose time, you know, one week. They were at 10 weeks, let's say, and then suddenly they had a catastrophic fever. A lot of hemorrhage, drop by three lines or more. We push them back to four weeks and then extend again. Okay. Worldwide, I think you find that uh, US, most people, most physicians are now using treat and extend in Australia. Okay. Asia, still lagging behind. Most of this is Australian data, actually. So the, the one third of the, uh, patients receiving treat and extend were mainly from Australia. Even in Singapore, only about a third of our patients are treat and extend. The majority are on PRN, and not even proper PRN, loose PRN. If you look at the Australian example, after 2009, they started increasing their use of treat and extend. So you find that their visual acuity results improve and maintain. That is a good test of whether that regimen works or does not work. This is a nice study because these patients were initially treated on PRN. This was in uh, Christian Proente's group. This is in Switzerland. So you see that in the PRN phase, most patients after loading dose improve and then after it start to slip, right? Visual acuity start to drop. <coughs> then when they switch to treat and extend, the vision pick up again and then maintain with less intervisit variation. So you don't see the vision going up and down, up and down. Because PRN is like that. You wait for fluid, the vision drops, and you treat, goes up again, comes up and down. So this study shows quite nicely that when you switch from a PRN to a treat and extend, you actually have more stability of disease with more injections, but fewer visits. So you have one without the other. I mean, sometimes you can't have everything. More importantly, you see the variation in the macular thickness was tighter when they switch from PRN to treat and extend as you expect, because you're always, almost always treating a dry macula. Is anyone uncomfortable treating dry macula? You are uncomfortable, you are uncomfortable, but you are the ones who use treat and extend, right? No, okay. You are uncomfortable, why? So patients, how to explain to patients? Our, uh, in our setup, the uh, injections are not insured. The, the patients not are insured. not insured. So, yeah, so they have to pay for the mm -hmm. okay. And it's difficult to convince them that you don't have any visual activity loss, you don't have any changes on velocity. Uh, why, are, why are we treating? So later I will show you how to how to counsel patients why they need treatment. Next time. Anybody else not comfortable? You said you're not comfortable. Why? Hard to convince, hard to convince patients. Okay, I accept. Most patients will feel that they are better. In fact, almost perfect. Let's say macula is dry. How would you convince them to treat? Okay, I'll show you later how we can do that. In the past, one of the main criticisms of treat and extend is that not enough studies. We had a lot of studies on fix, a lot of studies on PRN, right? But treat and extend not enough. But that's different now. This is the latest count of all the, to me, significant studies. We have 
PRN, all the this is retrospective, prospective, and then this is real world evidence. So more and more data. In fact, from the meta analysis, you can see quite a lot of patients on on three right? So there's a growing body of evidence. I want to highlight two. The first one is called the trend study done in the US, comparing monthly gold standard versus treat and extend remedizumab. Okay. 12 months prospective randomized mask study, retreatment criteria for TNE, if the basis of disease activity, yeah, if disease activity was absent, extend by two weeks to a maximum of 12 weeks. If there was disease activity, you reduce by, sh by two weeks, shortened by two weeks, but never less than four weeks, meaning that your minimum is four weekly treatment, which is correct. I mean, very rarely do we have to treat our patients three weekly or two weeks. Uh, very rare. So this is the standard treatment extent protocol. This was uh, how the two groups were. This is a randomized study. Okay, so well balanced. Visual acuity about 60 letters. Significant amount of fluid, 500 microns. There was no significant or statistical difference between the two groups. So three and extend and monthly were equivalent. Equivalent is not equal, by the way. Usually, non-inferiority, we set a target before the study. We say, let's say three letters difference, that's non-inferior. Or five letter difference, non-inferior. So here, 6.2 letter gain in treat and extend, 8.1 letter gain in monthly. And statistically, no significant difference between the two. Does that mean that treat and extend is better than monthly? Probably not. I think there is still a little bit of one letter, two letter notes, but maybe not relevant, right? Patient may not feel it. So you can see very nicely the curve. Monthly treatment, very stable. So that's still the gold standard. But with treat and extend, despite being proactive, huh? we're not waiting for fluid to appear. Can you see? Now, why do you think there's still a bounce? Because you extended too quickly. That means some of these episodes, the patient was wet. Macular was not dry. Then you had to pull back. Can you see? So for a variety of reasons, sometimes the disease goes into a bit of variable phase. Now once it reaches uh, equilibrium, that timing is quite regular. So I'm sure many of you have patients four or five years now. I have three and extend, done three and extend now for about five years. So some patients, once they reach a stable state, that interval is very, very rhythmic, it's clockwork. We know. 10 weeks they are dry, but 9 weeks, I'm oh, sorry, 11 weeks they are wet. Okay? So if that's the case, of course that's useful. OCT, slight difference, but no statistical difference. Number of injections, 43% was between 6 and 8 injections. And 24.8%, quarter of patients still required monthly injections. So, in a quarter of cases, you may not be able to extend meaningfully at all. And you have to explain that to the patient. If you're going to do three and extend, we can't always successfully extend you. So you're actually as good as monthly treatment, right? Because I can't extend you. I, every time I expand, extend, there's fluid and activity. So I have to pull back to four weeks. So it's not perfect either. Injection of interval of at least eight weeks, which is quite good. That means they don't need to come back and see you before eight weeks. Not bad, right? 20% eight weeks, 19% 10 weeks, 18% 12 weeks. We don't usually go beyond 12 weeks. Do you know why? Why? Why 12 weeks so special? First, we had experience with VIEW, right? Kept PRN at 12 weeks, so we don't dare go beyond 12 weeks. But other people have tried. They go beyond 12 weeks to test. 50% of them break through after 12 weeks. 50%. And most of them lose vision. So I think at the moment, there is still 
consensus that 12 weeks is about the maximum that you can go to. There is a new study out of Japan that looks at 16 week maximum, so four months. In fact, I chaired a round table to look at whether or not we could extend from 12 weeks to 16 weeks. But you do that at your own risk. Okay, the literature does not support you. In Australia, very similar. Plus nine, nine plus weeks, which is more than two months, right? Can extend. About a third of patients can achieve that. So if you say, well, is this fantastic? Can everybody be extended to three months? The answer is no. Probably a mixed bag. Some patients more active, they need to come down to five to six weeks or seven to eight weeks. Okay. Remember I mentioned rival? I mentioned this because their tree and extent was interesting. The dose injection, uh, dose adjustment was dependent on three criteria. I find this quite useful in clinical practice. The first is vision loss of at least five letters. Second, hemorrhage, the included hemorrhage, which is an important sign of activity. And third, any fluid, intraretinal or subretinal. They did not include patients with PD. Right? Dose adjustment, if it's one of the three, you reduce by two weeks. Two or more criteria present, you reduce by four weeks. So that's a modification of three and extent. I leave it to you if you're trying PME, which one? For me, it's much simpler. You just use two weeks. Up, two weeks down. But for severe cases, you might want to consider dropping by four weeks rather than two weeks. Is it a hard and fast rule, two weeks? Can you extend by one week? Yes. Sometimes I extend by one week because I'm not sure whether or not the patient can last two weeks. So it is possible for you to do your own modification. This showed that between the two agents, ranibizumab and Fibrisab, there was no significant difference in the result of treatment extent. I hear often that the Fibrisab lasts longer and therefore is a better agent for treatment extent. But the data actually does not support that. In fact, in this data, you find that ranibizumab had a slightly better visual outcome. So whatever study you do, sometimes it flips. One better than the other. But really no statistical significance. Why? Because the disease is not so much dependent on the duration of the drug alone, but on the ability of the eye to keep itself dry. Not the drug. If you are out to 10 weeks interval, there's no agent that remains in the eye for 10 weeks. None. So the eye is dry not because of the drug. The eye is still dry because of the patient. So this just mean number of injections. We know that comparison between the two drugs. Remember, I was telling you no difference. This is three and extent. Both are three and extent. All right. So there's really no basis to suggest that if Fibrisab is longer acting or if Fibrisab works better for three and extent. Both are equally fine. So how do you choose your own preference? Your own preference. I have one uh, retinal specialist from South America. So I asked him, how do you decide? He says, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Renibisumab. <laughs> Tuesday, Thursday, if you decide. You know, it's like China, right? Odd number you drive on certain days, even number you drive on certain days. So that, that was his style, you know. I use a slightly different approach. I use one drug almost exclusively as start and then I decide whether I want to change or not. So if let's say I'm going to use Renibizumab for loading dose, I'll give Renibizumab for everybody. And then from there I decide whether or not they are doing well or Renibizumab or they're not doing so well. Later we'll discuss that part of it. Okay? But that's again up to you. Right? Or you could do Bevacizumab for everybody first and then decide to switch later. Whatever it is, if you treat early and you sustain that treatment, then you have a reasonable, good, reasonably good chance of maintaining vision. This is the real world evidence. Okay? If you start good, you don't gain. 
maybe you slip a little bit. But it allows you to keep on driving, allows you to keep on reading, and maybe working. If you start there, you catch up, but you never reach the normal. So the key is early diagnosis, early referral, so you need to talk to your general ophthalmology colleagues. That it's worthwhile sending even when the vision is good. Right? Don't wait until the vision drops. And predictability is interesting, because in your vascular AMP, there seems to be some kind of timer, like an internal clock. So this is a very nice study, because I like to quote this because the variability was small up to 40 weeks. That means you can predict very, very uh, reliably that the disease is going to be active if you don't treat it that point. Isn't that interesting? If the disease was totally unreliable, very variable, it would be difficult to treat an extent. So what are the advantages and disadvantages? Let's talk about disadvantages first, right? You're treating a dry macula, you have to convince patient, and then if he gets an optomitis, then how are you going to explain? Okay. There's also a greater cost involved, right? You're treating more. It does not identify the patient who actually don't need treatment. You can actually stop treatment. So when do you stop? Sometimes never. Let's say only I, I won't stop. But if the patient has good fellow eye, this eye has been on three monthly injections for the past year, I would usually stop. That means withhold, but monitor. Sometimes it comes back, sometimes it doesn't. But I feel that the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. The advantages are you uh, not waiting for disease to happen, so you are protecting the tissue. Yes, you are treating more, but you have fewer visits. Okay. So treat and extend is more proactive, actually logistics-wise better. That means the patient, whenever he comes, you know he's going to get an injection. So you can plan your resources accordingly. Psychologically, different patients react differently. I have patients who say, I prefer tree and extent. Otherwise, I can't sleep a few days before the appointment. And then after that, they come and you tell them, no need injection. Oh, you know, like they won the lottery. <laughs> so psychologically, they go through ups and downs, a lot of up and go. Right? They'll tell you, oh, you know, I couldn't sleep for the past few days. Other patients say, I like treat and extend because I know it's exactly. active. But not everybody, as you mentioned, some patients are very resistant to treating when the macula is dry. And that is their right, right? You can tell them, like, if they refuse treatment, they refuse treatment, it's okay. So how do you decide, how do you convince them that in circumstances, certain situations, you actually need to an extent? Not everybody needs to an extent, okay? So, aggressive disease, you need to be proactive. By aggressive disease, we means the fellow eye has a very bad cause, very bad outcome. So only eye, right? Rap, bad outcome. CNB from Android streets, bad outcome, right? In, in pseudoxanthoma and so on. Vascularized PDs again, well, you have to be more aggressive in these cases. Tend to overtreat. When the patient says, I cannot come back, I cannot come back every four weeks or six weeks. Maybe he lives very far away. Possible, right? So I will ask patient, how often can you come back for a follow-up? If you choose PRN, you must commit to coming back all the six weeks. And sometimes it's not the patient's fault, it's our fault. We attend conference like this. <laughs> then they call up the clinic and say, oh, I'm sorry, doctor is you know in uh, Bangkok, <laughs> attending ISASO or MBAO. So it's not his fault. <laughs> Cannot get appointment, right? So sometimes, we also cannot meet our end of the bargain, right? Frequent monitoring. And then this concept I want to show you and share with you. It's called early recurrent disease. This is not in any textbook, okay? But if you look at previous trials, after the first in three injections, patients go into three patterns. 
The first group stay very quiet <coughs> with minimal number of PRN inj injections required. So they needed extra two over the whole year, 53%. The remainder didn't do so well. From one, three to five, disease come back. How do we know? Because we saw these patients every month. But we may not need it. We may not need to treat. So when we did that, you see this critical window from month three to five after the loading goes gives you a glimpse into how active the disease is. So I tell patients, you get your first three loading doses, then we watch, let's say it's dry, we watch for two months. In those two months, if you remain dry, I will give you the benefit of the doubt that you are in the first group. The only treatment so often, but you come back four to six weeks. But if you start to show activity within the first two months, after the loading dose, it's not going to do well because your visual acuity will go like that with PRN. Those are the people I would encourage them to consider treatment. That's how you convince patients who otherwise say, I'm fine. You're not fine. Because we know that if you come have disease soon after your loading dose, your final visual acuity with PRN is going to be poor. It's like you never started treatment at all. What's the point? In fact, over seven years, this growth will drop into below baseline. That means they actually lose more than they have. This is another one. Excite study means first three injections, then don't treat. After that, but at three months, they give the patient. Three months. I have some clinicians who also do that. Anyone still doing this? First three injections, after which quarterly. Not good because 42% will do well, but the same pattern. From month three to five, those who did not receive treatment in the month four and month five, disease came right back. So I use this to predict, not 100%, but to predict the likelihood of needing proactive or reactive treatment. So I'm not saying that from the start you have to be P, P and E, or from the start you're going to be P and N. The only criterion, of course, for PRN is that the patient must come back from six weeks, right? Straight away, if the patient says, no, I can only come back maybe eight weeks, you know, maximum, I can't come back every month. Then I say, we'll try and extend you, even then I can't guarantee, right? You saw that a proportion of them cannot go beyond six weeks. That's the nature of the disease. If that is the case, then the patient has to accept it. There's nothing we can do. I mean, we don't have anything else that we can offer you. Unless it is polypoidal or something. So, what are my three and extend criteria? I think for extension, that's quite clear, right? Anybody has questions about extension criteria? No disease activity. Vision must be stable. No fluid or no CT spectral domain. This one is not required. Resolution of pigment epithelial detachment. That means you can still extend if the PED has not resolved. But there must not have any intraretinal fluid subject. Would you extend if the PED is enlarging? Answer is no. I would not extend, I'll keep it. Or maybe even drop it by two weeks to see whether I can pull back. This is a consensus approach that was chaired by Ray Freud, and it's basically telling us the same thing. If you have time, you can refer to this retina 2015. Once maximum response is attained, you extend the follow up interval in the absence of these factors. So we've already discussed this. So let's Go through it again. What are the criteria for extension? When would you extend the disease? No activity, meaning no fluid, vision, stable, no hemorrhage. Okay, those three are the primary ones. If you want to include shroom, you can include shroom. But don't forget there's a small group who do very well with minimal treatment. We all have that in our locker, right? And therefore, that colors, in, in a way, it distorts our impression of AMD. We say, but my patient, that one, I treated three times, and then I have not treated for five years after that. That's 
a minority, it's an exception rather than the rule. This is one exception. 612 measured at baseline. You can see a CNV treated with three initial injections dry, six over six. Patient did not have any recurrences since 2009, nothing at all, zero. Would you have treated this patient with 3 and extend? If, let's say, everybody who walks through your door 3 and extend, yeah, you would have over-treated this patient. But if you follow what I'm telling you, month 3 to 5, look for early recurrence. I would not have treated the patient on 3 and extend. So hopefully, you, it's a hit and miss, but you try and reduce the time when you go to treatment. And as you mentioned, sometimes patient doesn't want treatment extended, right? So it's the patient's choice. Preference for minimal number of injections. Bilateral disease is an increasing problem, right? Some patients, if you are treatment extended, it's very difficult. One eye eight weeks, one eye ten weeks. Very difficult. So we usually go with the eye with the shorter interval. So you over-treat them. But some patients don't want, right? I mean, the other eye actually doesn't need it for another two weeks. So how do you manage that? I don't know the answer. And do you give bilateral same-day injections? Anybody? You still do? Yeah, anyone? Why do you not do it? Infection? Yes, good. What other risk? Systemic risk. We'll talk about systemic risk in the afternoon when I talk about DNA. Okay? Particularly high risk population. So elderly patients, patients with previous stroke, recent heart attack. You are doubling the dose, so doubling the exposure. Systemic. So you may not want to give same day injections, but sometimes it's just not convenient if they have an impact. So sometimes I do the next day. I may not even do it. Severe glaucoma. This is interesting, right? I mean I don't know how many of you check pressure immediately after injection, anybody? Do you check? I will keep. So normally what's the pressure? Let's say, when do you check after injection? Half an hour, one hour? Three to four hours. Then they have to stay in the clinic for three to four hours. That's quite a long time. My patients are itching to go after three to four minutes. <laughs> but if you were to check, let's say three to four hours, are most of the patients having high IOD or not? So by 3-4 hours, it settles down. If you were to do 5-10 minutes, I think majority will have high IOD. And in the extreme case, we are afraid of central retinal artery occlusion, right? That's why we count fingers, we show our hands, smile at them, and so on, right? Because some of them, the pressure is so high that it closes off central retinal artery. So I hope you still make it a habit. After injection, check, count fingers, if not sure, do a DIO, look for pulsation of the central retinal artery, and if necessary, what do you do? Paracentesis. Now, does anyone do prophylactic paracentesis on all your cases? Good, because it's not recommended. It's not recommended because the risk of endophthalmitis increases with paracentesis. And sometimes paracentesis can cause other things, right? Like lens touch, traumatic cataract. So if you don't need to, don't do a paracentesis. 0.5 cc, sorry, 0.05 cc is generally well tolerated by normal life. So you should not have long, prolonged pressure spikes. But there are some problems, some patients, where even a little bit of pressure spike, the patient will already very compromised optimally. Just be careful because you can technically cause a wipeout. So discuss that with them. I I have not had occasion to withdraw treatment, right? Because it's a double whammy. You imagine you've got severe glaucoma, loss of peripheral fuse, and then now they got AMD, they lose central fuse. It's horrible, right? Imagine. So most of the time we want to maintain the central fuse. So you have to treat. What's the solution? Give less. <coughs> you know that there are two doses for the Indivisumab, right? 0 0.3 and 0 0.5, and actually in the trial, 0 0.3 and 0 0.5 perform about the same. Maybe one, two letter difference. So you can give 0 0.3. You don't always have to give 0 0.5. Any graph? The flipper said, no, because we don't know how much is acceptable, right? But randomly, you can adjust the dose, you can bring the volume down. 
I just put in geographic atrophy because this is a hot topic, especially in the West, about geographic atrophy being caused by frequent anti-VEGF injections. How many of you believe <coughs> that anti-VEGF causes geographic atrophy? No? Okay, so I don't need to go through the next few slides. There is no evidence that anti-VEGF therapy is the cause of geographic atrophy. Geographic atrophy is the end point of AMD. You don't do anything also, they will go on to look at that. And these are the high risk patients with geographic atrophy. Fellow I, very important. Type 3, which is RAP. Patients with reticular pseudomonas and very thin porous. So if they have these factors, you know already, they are predisposed to geographic atrophy. You don't want to aggravate it. So some physicians, they will not give over treatment. They will give PRN treatment. I don't agree with that. Because I think that the geographic atrophy will be made worse if you undertreat by leaving by introvert. So this is controversial. But you will hear some retinal specialists and world famous people talking about that. How do I know? Well, if you look at CAT study, five years, so very long study, if it is true that anti VEGF causes geographic atrophy, which group would have the most atrophy? is the ones who receive monthly treatment. Correct? Monthly treatment. The answer is those who have monthly treatment compared to those with PRN, no difference. No difference. So my simple mind tells me that I don't think it is about the drug, but it's about the disease. And if you don't act adequately control disease, you also end up I just want to show you a tree and extend case. This is a difficult case. Okay, vascularized PED, no PCD or wrap. And look at all this twink. This is like a starry sky appearance, right? So basal band. Three loading doses, a blivacet. Look at what happened to the PED bigger. <coughs> Visual acuity the same. Patient more symptomatic because he gave it methotoxin. Not happy, switch. Renivizumab, after three doses, about the same. So no change, not much better than Eblivacet, but at least not increasing. But if you continue to inject monthly, up to the fifth injection, you see that there's a response. So moral of the story, you treat until you see a response if possible. Don't give up, right? After three injections, don't give up. Here, you had six injections, plus another two, eight injections. So at this level, I'm still not happy yet because he's got new sensory fluid, right? The sub fluid, so the PED is better. I extend by one week because I'm not sure whether or not I can extend by two weeks. So for five weeks, I go to week six. He actually increases. So I cut back to five. I could have cut back to four, I guess. But I, I said, okay, let's do a compromise. So at five, he's maintained at this level. So this is the reality that not all patients can be extended to 12 weeks. So I don't want you to go home with the idea that, you know, oh, every patient I can extend to 12 weeks. No, about a third of patients you can extend. So one third, one third, one third. Okay. So to end, I think nobody disputes anti vegetable post cancer treatment, right? And the best, best, best form of treatment is fixed monthly or QA, at least in the first year. But in the ideal world, different from the real world, PRN and tree and extend are useful strategies to reduce the number of treatments <coughs> compared to monthly. And then when I use PRN and tree and extend, we've already discussed, it is up to you to convince patients which treatment strategy is ideal for them. Sometimes a patient goes through different phases in their disease. In the first phase, maybe they're very active, so they need to an extent. After which, then maybe you can ease off and go to a PRN. So this is really your skill, the art of managing a patient long-term with AMD. You are not needing a cookbook and just putting in the ingredients. At some stage, you have to have your own flavor, and that is the art of I hope you all will continue to hone that skill, not just apply the science, which is the data, but the art. Thank you very much.
Uh, sir, two questions, please. Uh, first, there was one symposium I um, attended in India about the PCV patient, yeah. or the patient. So, there's one professor telling us at the time that uh, for PCV patient, mostly people try to kill the body as soon as possible, make it dry, but when you kill the body, basically, you make an atrophy, right. and basically, it's the end. So some groups try to not to kill the polyp as soon as possible, but try to keep it stabilized. So what do you think about that? This first question. Okay. So in PCV, I'm glad you asked that because we don't actually have a lecture on PCV. The point is not to treat the whole lesion over and over again repeatedly, because that's exactly it, right? You end up with a dry macular, vision worse because of RPA atrophy. Why? Because you're treating very big zones, especially over the branching vascular network. You don't need to. Now, when we want to close polyps, we do selective EDT retreatment. Meaning that when there's recurrence, and we think it's coming from polyps, we only target the polyps. So the PDT is over a very small area, usually extra foveal or just off the foveal. You only target the active polyps for repeat treatment. And with that, I think we can avoid the problem with progressive RP. Thank you, sir. Uh, second question. Can we come back to the slide uh, for the treatment treat and extent? There is a slide before. Still painting. There is a set of um, how you do treat and extent. with the four week injection, four week injection, and yes. there is two grams. Ah, okay, okay, okay. That was way back. Yeah, way back. Yeah, okay, yes. What's so, the question? Yes. Just to make sure that I don't misunderstand it. Yeah. So, first patient can inject, 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 four, inject, inject three times. This no, not necessarily three times. No, it's three times. Right? We said that. We inject until no disease activity. So it may be 10 times, it may be 12 times. So the remaining phase is not limited in three. It could be many, many times yes. until there is no, no more activity. activity. There's, there is no more fluids, no hemorrhoids, and the visual acuity is stable. Absolutely. And then yes. we give bonus two weeks yes. to the patient. And then come six weeks. Yes. Once, keep, six weeks. Six weeks. keep injecting. Yeah. Dry, eight weeks. Eight weeks. Dry, 10 weeks. Dry, 12 weeks, keep at 12 weeks. 12 weeks, maximum. Maximum. But when something goes wrong, for example, in the, in the lower one. Correct. So, drop, we drop two weeks, two weeks. Correct. Uh, the fastest will be two weeks interval, but can be every one week if we so there is a, some um, extraordinary event happen to the patient. Correct. So your reduction and your increase, right, is variable. Some people like to reduce by two weeks, some people drop by one week. That's up to you. But this is an important concept, right? Because we are not saying that all disease will be acquired by three months. Most, most are, most are. So if the patient is quiet after three loading doses, great, great, then you extend it, okay? But if it's not stable, keep, keep on the, going. And how is the R about switching the regimens? I mean, you said before, sometimes we are not enough injecting, so we keep injecting, so when is the sweet point that we say, this is not working for you, let's try this one. So let's say PRN, okay, let's say PRN. I can't go beyond, I'm getting injection every time he comes to see me. Let's say every four to six weeks activity. Then I'll tell patient that I'll try and ex see whether we can do a treat and extend to see if we can extend the interval. Otherwise, the patient is coming every four weeks or six weeks for treatment. Sometimes you can't, right? Sometimes you can't extend. Or the patient is not coming in time. He was supposed to come one month, but let's say he came only two months. 
after his last injection, and he was active at that point. So obviously, you are under-treating the patient because he's in healing count. So these are the situations where we discuss, and we say, we have a way of extending your visits so that you don't necessarily have to come every four weeks, but we inject at every visit. Okay, so these are situations where you have to try and convince patients that because he is not getting the best result with PRN, he should be on treatment center. Yeah. Um, from your treatment extent, uh, patients that you have, uh, do you have any anecdotal evidence that, or you not know, to suggest an observation to suggest that patients who are post retractomized eyes do they actually uh, require shorter visits you know, uh, intervals? And, and can you just uh, share with us how, how I mean, your, your injection uh, protocol, do you, you put formula on 5% or do you use antibiotics after that? Yeah. Okay, so first a vitrectomy question. It's a, actually a million dollar question. We don't know. There is a trial now with the DRCR ads on coding, right? That's for DME. Because you're more likely to face that situation maybe in DME, in diabetics. Actually, there is no evidence that a retractomized eye needs more frequent injections. That needs from four weeks to three weeks or something like that. Although when you do animal studies, you look at rabbit clearance of drug is faster in a retractomized. Makes sense, right? But the clue is this. It is not necessarily the drug in the vitreous that's important, but how much of it gets into the back, the retinal tissues. And maybe that's why clinically we may not see a big difference between retractomized and non retractomized so I don't treat these patients differently unless they are not responding to an anti-VEGF injection. Then in DME, we have a course steroid. We can use a slow-release implant. So that takes away this issue of faster clearance by the treatment. But the answer, short answer is no. There is no clear proof that you have to give retractomized patients more frequent treatment. You might, but not consistently. Now, technique. The most important techniques are covidone IV, speculum to keep the eyelashes away, drape, gloves, optional. I feel mask is important. Post op antibiotics, optional. How many of you use post op antibiotics? Majority. I still do. Why? Because I still think that water hygiene is a problem. So when they have a bath, a shower, and so on, I don't know what's the bacterial content manager do. But what does the data suggest? Actually, post-op antibiotics is worse than no antibiotics. The meta-analysis show the rate of endophthalmitis is still low, but it's higher in people with antibiotic eye drops. Think about it, why? Number one, contamination. They don't know how you keep the antibiotic drop. Number two, you know how patients put eye drop, right? Three, resistance. The issue is resistance, right? So I give uh, patients a choice. Let's say a patient has been treated somewhere else. Most of some of my patients from US, Australia, they don't use uh, antibiotics. They only have a lubricant. So I give them a choice. If they don't want, just use them. There is actually a move towards not using antibiotics. We have something called Vision Academy. I don't know whether you've heard of Vision Academy. So I'm in the steering committee. And we have published uh, recently guidelines of Vision Academy viewpoints that prophylactic antibodies are actually not necessary and may be harmful to the long term. So I don't use prophylactic antibodies. My typical protocol is over 10% of the surface, 5% in the fornix, with speculum, and I like those with the blade rather than the, the wire, because the wire, the eyelashes will come through. I usually drape, I always wear a mask and a pair of gloves. And then the injection, of course, with a 30 gauge needle. Mine is at the bottom, you can do it at the top. After which, count fingers, put in the drop of uh, antibiotic, close here. Okay. There is no secret to it. The main thing is what we don't have. If you don't use pomidon iron, then your infection rate goes up two to three times. Very, very, very important. The rest of it, the technique and all that, not so important. Anybody use a different technique? 
Anybody not using povidone iodine? Must use povidone iodine. And you cannot use 10% for the eye. It's too much. They will come back tomorrow with very red eye, sandy and all that, right? You have to use 5%. But the skin, you can use 10%. So I think we are more or less aligned now. I think most people are quite, that's why I didn't spend any time on uh, the injection protocol. Most of you are experts in, in giving injections. Okay. I think we should break for lunch. Right. Now, after lunch, how long do you need to eat? <laughs>